Professor Rebecca Monson and I'm based at the ANU College of Law at the Australian National University. We are based here on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and I thank them for their stewardship of these lands over many thousands of years. I offer my respect and gratitude to their elders past and present and I acknowledge that this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. As Australia's National Law School, based in the lawmaking heartland of Australia, we understand that we have a unique responsibility to engage with questions of law in Australia, across the Pacific and beyond. We know that questions of justice in Australia cannot be disentangled from questions of justice for people across our sea of islands. As part of our engagement with Pacific people and the region, we hosted a number of eminent Pacific leaders in April 2023. The discussion you're about to see with Dame Meg Taylor and Tui Loma Naroni Slade was filmed as part of that visit. Dame Meg was the first woman Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum from 2014 until 2021. She was also the founding vice president of the Office of the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman for the International Finance Corporation. Dame Meg has served on numerous United Nations committees as a diplomat and in the office of the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Sir Michael Samare. Dame Meg currently serves on the boards of Number One Super and the PNG Sustainable Development Program and she also serves as an advisor to the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank. Dame Meg is an advisor to the Vanuatu government on its application to the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on climate change and human rights. Meg has a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Melbourne and a Masters of Law from Harvard University. She's very well known as a strong advocate for women and youth. Tui Loma Naroni Slade was also Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum from 2008 until 2014. He was the first Samoan to be appointed as Attorney General of Samoa and one of the first elected judges of the International Criminal Court. He served as a Samoan diplomat, as Acting Chief Justice of Samoa, as Senior Counsel in the Commonwealth Secretariat in London and as Chair of Small Island States. Naroni Slade was chair of the committee who established the University of the South Pacific Law School and developed the syllabus for the school. He continues to be engaged on international legal issues and on assignments in Samoa and the Pacific region. Tui Loma Naroni Slade is currently board chair of the Samoa Ports Authority, an independent member of the Judicial Service Commission and advisory member of the Australian Pacific Security College. In the discussion that you're about to see, Dame Meg, Tuiloma, Naroni Slade and I discuss their own and the Pacific region's priorities and perspectives of the law in an era of climate change. Meg and Naroni bring decades of experience to these matters and I hope you enjoy the following discussion as much as I did. Thank you, Tony, and thank you everyone for being here and thank you particularly to Naroni and Meg for generously um, sharing their time and insight with us today. Um, I thought we might start with, uh, we're going to try and keep this a Talanoa or Talk Story style, so we do have some questions to ask, but we're also hoping to have lots of time to open it up for Q&A. Um, I thought maybe we could start with a question about what initially drew you both to the law? What did you see it as it being its opportunities, hopes and also limitations and also, as Tony said in his generous introductions, he mentioned the fact that you both did your law degrees overseas. So I was wondering if you wanted to share a bit about that experience and, and why you took that path in the first place. Well, first of all, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and thank them for having us. <coughs> but also, let me acknowledge the young people in the room, huh? the future generations. <laughs> And um, thank you for being here. And hopefully we can share our information with you and also the experts on the Pacific who are in the room I'm, who I'm terrified of. <laughs> they know who they are. <laughs> um, law school wasn't my first interest. I, w I wanted to be an agricultural economist. Um, my family come from the highlands of Papua New Guinea, big agricultural area. 
and that was what I wanted to do. And I'd applied to go to uh, university here in Australia to, to do that. And then what happened was, um, because we didn't have the high schools where I came from, I was sent away to boarding school for a long time. And when the time came to go, I said to my father, I just can't, I just can't go. And he said, well, you better find something to do. But during my school days, I became very close friends with one of your former justices, but he was a uh, uh, Queen's Council at that time, was uh, Hal Wooden. Hal Wooden had come to Manus as a young student and anthropology, doing his anthropological work there and befriended my fam family. So for my school holidays, I'd go and stay with Hal. And he, being who he was, uh, would talk a lot. And that's who had a great influence on me in terms of the law. So when the time came, I said to my father, you know, I've, thought, I've also thought about the law. So I called up the University of Papua New Guinea that had just started, had, had only been in existence for a couple of years, and they said, well, get an application in right away. And that's, that's how it all started. It wasn't uh, something that I dreamt about all the time. I would go to Hal Wooden's chambers a lot and sit with him in the afternoon when I could, and I had time off uh, at school, but um, um, I wasn't inspired by trying to do some great work in my country as a lawyer. I just I wasn't. It was just to have an act, to have a degree in something. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to be honest. I always pined for for the agricultural side. Me. Hello, <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dean, thank you for your kind words, much too kind. Um, and I, jo I readily join um, Dame Meg in um, honoring the, this ground. Thank you for that. Um, on that, I, uh, again, I share with Meg, I actually um, wanted uh, a degree in science. It's what I understood uh, at school. Um, so how I ended up in law was uh, sheer parental pressure. Um, um, in a way, I, I think my generation uh, was Samoa's uh, investment uh, in its resources in preparation for independence. Um, we um, were in the front line of um, young students uh, in the 1960s being sent abroad uh, for training. Um, um, as I bid farewell to my father on the first trip abroad, um, he suggested that um, I might um, become a lawyer. I had no idea how this came about. Uh, we did not have a family solicitor as far as I knew. We did not know anybody in the law. Certainly there was no teaching or inclination in whatever manner about law and what law is. So it um, um, in New Zealand, where I went to university, it was a totally different environment from my country, uh, rather stressful in so many uh, ways, um, but uh, and particularly scholastically in a field for which I really had not been prepared. But somehow the task was done and uh, I managed to return as amongst the first um, of Samoans uh, to be trained in law. Um, with the law degree, I joined the office of the Attorney General and a grand staff of two. Um, the Attorney General, a British barrister, and me. Um, and it was so for a few years. Um, so one uh, was at the deep end, uh, almost uh, from the start. Um, but uh, in that time, it, 
I guess it um, had to happen. I became the first Samoan to hold office as uh, uh, Attorney General, and, and in uh, those 15 years, I, I was um, uh, kicked upstairs to look after the Supreme Court uh, for interim periods. Um, um, my work in Samoa was deeply, uh, deeply satisfying. Um, there was, was uh, exposure uh, for me to be involved in the region. I had helped to create the Pacific Forum line and became chairman of that line for many years and um, served on the board with the distinguished president of um, Kiribati, who is here, uh, President Anote Tong. So I was not a stranger uh, to the region. Um, the, uh, uh, but uh, with the, my engagement in a number of things, um, in the negotiations on the law of the sea, my having had fellowships in Canada at the Academy, at the World Court in The Hague, and at the United Nations Legal Office uh, in New York, I had seen a much wider world. And I had begun to sense the limitations of a, a, career, a career uh, in Samoa. So the big decision was taken, 1982, to go to London and join the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, and um, from there onwards, uh, the start of an, uh, a career as a lawyer, as a diplomat, and as an international judge over a quite an extensive period of some 25 years. Um, um, my time on the International Criminal Court uh, was an utmost privilege. Utmost privilege. But equally, uh, my work in the Commonwealth um, and at the United Nations uh, were um, high points, uh, very high po career point, uh, high, high career points. Uh, in mostly because it enabled me in a leadership role to work amongst the wider community of island countries from around the world as chairman of EOSIS. Um, and to deal with issues that are so fundamental to our region. Uh, development, legal developments amongst the judges and lawyers, um, issues, uh, the, uh, law of the sea issues, climate change, human rights, and so on. And this anchored me in the work uh, back in the Pacific and became of inestimable value uh, when in 2008 I returned uh, to the region and uh, became uh, Secretary General of the Forum. Um, the um, work there, of course, uh, it, it's been a, a, a just an honor uh, to be of service. Uh, to all our countries and to the institutions um, of our region. Um, I, I believe um, that the Forum Association of States and Peoples uh, have been an unquestionable success. Um, and I say that with utter sincerity um, and belief in regionalism. Perfect? Of course not. And it will continue to be a challenging institution for our region. There is as much work before us today and the challenges as it was yesterday when I was there and I'm sure 
it was in the day of, of Dame Meg. But it's an absolutely fundamental need for you and for me, and I will continue to offer my services to be of whatever assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maroni, and thank you, Meg. Um, you, you were both um, the Secretary General for the Pacific Islands Forum, and I wondered, perhaps we can start with you, Meg, um, what you saw as being the most significant challenges, whether they were legal, political or environmental or other, at the time of your leadership, and whether you've seen them change... Um, since that time and what you would see as being the most significant challenges and also the opportunities facing the region at this point in time. So um, I took over from Neroni and I think his experience was very different to mine. I came in um, not welcomed by the host government, that was obvious. I don't think there was, anyone spoke to Neroni for many years there. <laughs> but it was the civil society that um, did the traditional ceremonies to welcome me. And as a, as a Pacific Islander, as a Melanesian woman, I felt that prior to that, walking, on the, walk, walking in the streets of uh, Suba, I never felt totally comfortable because I noticed that people would turn their heads the other way, particularly public servants uh, in, the, in, the, in the beginning. But once those ceremonies were done, I felt a, 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 an empathy. But I came in at a, t at a time when Sir Makera Marauta, the former Prime Minister of, of Papua New Guinea, had been given the mandate to go in and look do a review of the Pacific Plan. <coughs> and what he said was missing was the politics, that the leadership of the Pacific had to make be engaged in the politics and make those tough decisions that they weren't making. And the second issue that he talked about was inclusivity, that the voice of the people of the Pacific had to be heard. So our mandate was clear, but it was wide in the sense of what are the, what are the structural uh, and the organisational aspects that you have to deal with to bring people together. And that became the challenge of the Pacific, uh, of the Pacific Island Forum. There needed to be a total change in the way work was done, not just writing reports and sending it off to countries and hoping that it would happen. It was really being very engaged <coughs> with the forum, uh, with the officials committees, but also making sure that those conversations with the leaders embraced the politics again. So the framework of Pacific regionalism was the the concept that we were dealing with at that time and that was and the inclusivity was that when we got to the forum meetings private sector always met with the leaders but civil society never had a conversation with the leaders and we started off with a few civil society representatives meeting with a few specific leaders and it was the former prime minister of Samoa uh, Tulepa who then said no when the forum is hosted in Samoa, everybody comes. Anyone who comes, who comes. And that meant that the civil society got themselves very well organized about what were their priorities and when we were enabled it to be fed into the leaders so that they saw a broader picture of what was going across, on across the region, not just in their own countries, and that civil society had their networks and they were working together and they would bring those issues to the leaders. Yes, the conversations at times were quite stilted huh? because in the Pacific, the respect for your seniors, the respect for your leaders, uh, sometimes the younger ones were much more intimidated by the conversation. And as it went on, then the relationship started to build and we could do that. I think the most telling moment of the politics was at the forum meeting in Tuvalu when the leaders' meeting went for a duration of 12 hours and the issue of climate was the big issue where it wasn't a, like there wasn't a, a common thinking in, by everybody in that room particularly with um, one of our members and it was when the situation where I think 
very contentious debate on climate when Pacific leaders had to finally you know, make it very clear what the position was. And I think that was bringing the politic back into the region, into the, politi of the politics of the forum. There was criticism by some leaders after that 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 meeting should never have been allowed to carry on like that. But unless the leadership of the region is prepared to grapple with the issues that we face, uh, the Pacific is always going to be ones that um, are placated by the bigger powers in the region. And that, I think, has been the challenge all along. Um, I, have, I, I think I've answered. But I'm very pleased with the outcome of the fact that civil society uh, had a voice in that, and including people across the region. So they felt that the issues of the region belonged to them and that they could participate in it which for a long time before that it was just the, the power of the leaders and they made the decisions and the ministers below them. But now things are changing again and I think you've got to, all of you who are, are following what's happening in the Pacific, you've got to keep reading the information that's coming out from different writers huh, about what is happening and the divisions that are occurring and why are they occurring and whose interests are they? Do they serve the interests of the Pacific? And I would say right now they don't. I'll hand over to Naroni. I've seen challenges and difficulties um, in my time, but uh, my years at the uh, at the forum, 2008 to 2014, well. These were challenges that uh, came not in single file, but often in battalions. Um, I came at a time when the forum did something they had never imagined they would do, to suspend a member of itself. And not just a mere member, a founding member a major country of the Pacific. So that was a major, major challenge. The forum leaders had no idea, I certainly had no idea of the repercussions. We were headquartered in Fiji. I think for all of us there's a little bit of that country in all of us. It is so central to everything that this region does and has to do. But there it was, um, a country that was suspended. Suspended by a political decision. It is not possible for me to really go into much of the details, but I can say this much. It was not a recommendation of the Forum Secretariat. Thank you, President Tong, who is nodding. It was not a recommendation that came from me or from the secretary that I led. But as I say, let's deal with things that we can deal with. It was not an e easy year because that was also the year 2008 when the world was faced with a very serious banking and financial crisis. And we needed um, to find a response region-wise. We were able to and we devised what came to be known as the Cairns Compact. Uh, in part as a strategy to try to help uh, ban uh, banking institutions around the region to try to with withstand the pressures of this international um, phenomenon. And um, to some extent it worked, but we ran into, uh, uh, and interestingly, Part of that exercise was to put a track on the region, on the financial capitals that is available to this region for development purposes. 
And interestingly, not all of our developing partners were cooperative uh, in counting what financial resources are, and there's tons of it. So one was faced uh, with that sort of cross-regional difference. It was a time um, when political decisions uh, also were taken uh, to uh, review the trading arrangements of our region. Um, taken, I think uh, Australia and New Zealand became the main motivators of this. So another divisive issue, uh, the resulting document of um, PESA Plus uh, remains a divisive issue in the region. Um, it was about the time that some of the issues that are now uh, very obviously the most serious, climate change, has come, uh, had been dealt with in the region for many, many years. Uh, may I recognize amongst you Dr. Ian Fry. Ian and I have been involved in the climate debate since the 1990s. In 2008, very interestingly, our regional organizations began to come to grips with the seriousness of this issue around my time. It was particularly interesting to me that there ensued a battle between our regional organizations as to who owned climate change. Imagine that. And I could not believe myself that there was such a debate, but there was. So it became absolutely essential for me to put time to work in the coordination of regional organization. That was a big time effort in the Secretariat in organizing and ensuring that at least there was some rhythm, that there was some cooperative sense, and above all, an efficient regional response to many of these issues. Happily, I believe that um, uncertainty as which was the driving organization. Clearly, clearly SPREP had to play a, a leading role, but so does the Forum Secretariat, uh, largely for the political issues, and so does the community, uh, the, the, the SPC for the more technical work, and FFA most certainly. But I, I hope, Meg, I don't know whether they've resulted, but I hope there is now more unity, more uniformity in the regional response. So these were pretty major issues, um, moderator. Um, interesting uh, as, a, as, a, as a matter of, um, of professional challenge uh, to me. Uh, but a deeply troubling uh, relationship with the host government, uh, I would have to say. And I feel so terribly sorry about that because there were many institutions based in Fiji where I felt um, that a happier, more normal relationship uh, with Fiji would have helped uh, to improve on many of some of the issues that we're now to be picking up speed on. Something to that. Mm. I think the construct of the regional organizations is very, very important. Mm. Some of them are colonial, mm. again. You know, after the Second World War, SBC was set up, and now you have um, <coughs> metropolitan powers who are now back into, the, in, into SBC. Mm. Um, you have, I think, the United States, UK, member of SPREP. It has an impact on how mm. decisions are made, and how issues are perceived. What I had wanted as Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum was to ensure that it was the Pacific that was making the decisions and determining what was of interest. But even there, you've got a membership of French territories that have been admitted, and again, not on the advice of the, of the, of the Secretariat. And now, it's picking up the pieces after it all. And I think that it has weakened 
the, weakens the institution. And I think there's been some interesting um, evolution of with the uh, visit of Pacific leaders to the United States where countries that are not independent are now being almost assured that they'll be given their sovereignty. Well, you know, the question here is <coughs> who is one superpower to say we can bequeath you a sovereignty of nation, nationhood? All these issues are, compl are complex and complicated when we are also facing uh, other issues in the region that I think are much more important. Mm -hmm. Um, Meg, you just mentioned this challenge of um, like a, a, an institution or an organisation with um, a colonial heritage and the challenges of ensuring that it's now Pacific-led. And um, I'm very aware we've got quite a number of um, Pacifica lawyers in, in the room that are working with the law in creative ways. And as part of that... Um, the generation of lawyers that have gone before us, what do you see as being the opportunities and constraints of working with a legal system that is colonial? Is there, do we have any hope of disrupting it, reclaiming it, doing something different to it? Um, what are some of the challenges that you see there? And do you also see opportunities based on your own experiences working with it? I mean, all, all of us have different jurisdictions. Are you talking about our jurisdictions or are you talking about... Um... Well, it could be either. So this morning we touched on the challenge of um, the fact that custom is a source of law in yeah. many jurisdictions. What are the opportunities and constraints that we face there? And Naroni, um, you have a lot of experience with law of the sea in the international legal realm. And what are some of the constraints and opportunities that we face there? Do you, do you feel that it's a space that it's still worth us working in, struggling within? I guess the 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 uh, the, the the system and the quality of law needs to remain a national preoccupation um, and mandate. Um, and many of us uh, do face this um, uh, criteria uh, of where the line is draw to be drawn between uh, law as such and uh, custom and traditions uh, of the land and individually. I think uh, countries have to make uh, these uh, decisions which are constitutional uh, decisions. Um, but they do have impl implications for our region. Um, I was involved in the creation of the USB uh, Law School. Um, um, I had come um, from um, London to chair a group, um, uh, over 20 people, to determine a, 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 a syllabus uh, for the um, law school, which had been established in Port Vila in 1985. A decision was taken four or five years later to begin a law degree four-year law LLB program um, in, um, in, in the law school, and uh, we needed a syllabus. So we had to draw from the um, Pacific judges, senior government lawyers. We brought in representatives from the French University in the Pacific, people from abroad. Uh, your, one of your mentors, Dr. Guy Pose, bless his soul, was there, Don Patterson and few of the luminaries of the legal academic. And we managed to come up with a... The, the, at that time, there were um, a known shortages in legal drafting, for example, uh, in legal source materials, uh, whether research uh, or court judgments uh, and legislation templates, etc. So, and. The, there were also the practicalities. There were signs that the spaces in law schools in Australia, New Zealand, and I think uh, they make possibly in UPNG at the time. And USB needed to do some planning uh, for some of our own students to be trained at USB. Um, so the syllabus was geared 
at, um, the, at teaching of such quality to be sensitive uh, to the customary and the, the, the cultural traditions of the region. So very important from a teaching and a training perspective, yes. Um, but it also um, reflected a, a practical problem um, for those of you who are lawyers and who have practiced either in, in, in some of the Pacific countries. Um, I was taught at, uh, at a time, I was taught law in New Zealand at a time, New Zealand didn't even have a written constitution. <laughs> and I was sent home and expected not only to understand the written constitution of my country, uh, but to, to deal with, to advise the government on fundamental issues. And those of you who are constitutional lawyers or those practicing the bar will obviously know the vast difference between having a constitution and a written one. Big difference. So yes, these are these questions. Today, in my own country, um, custom is not law unless that custom has achieved the force of law, whatever the force of law means. <laughs> Very large tracts of land in my country are held according to the customs and the traditions of Samoa. There is a worry that this requirement of the law is tying up valuable resources uh, for economic development and so on. But of course there are fundamental issues of what is custom and what is law. Just last week a village dispute erupted. There was banishment of, um, of a, a, an important Matai or chief. Well, that sounds very much like a breach of the fundamental rights in our constitution a fundamental rights drawn directly from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenants. So how do we deal with these issues? We have a traditional ceremony of Ifonga or public apology. Is that a necessary excuse or mitigation of serious offending? Not easy to determine, but these are the the source of issues that I think are relevant to the question you have put to us. Thank you. So, you know, so just let, let me say that uh, you know, when I was at law school, we were still a, um, uh, a colony. Um, then in 1972, self-government, 73, no, 73, 74, then independence, 75. Huh? But in the Constitution, it refers to the development of the underlying law. And the underlying law is customs of the people of Papua New Guinea, but also the common law of England as of 15th of September 1975. Prior to that, um, and, uh, and also the adoption of certain statutes, uh, particularly the Criminal Code, the Queensland Criminal Code. The uh, work that the Law Reform Commission did, uh, which I joined uh, in, uh, no, I've forgotten all the, in the 70s, late 70s. Uh, in 2000, I understand that legislation has been passed, but the implementation has been quite challenging. But in Papua New Guinea, we also have the village court systems. And many of us use those for the issues that uh, we have to deal with in our own communities. Uh, women would argue that they don't get a fair chance in the village courts and they have a right to take the matter to the local court and then to the district court and up to the next, and to, through to the national court. <clears throat> I think the legal systems and what, uh, how we are situated will still be evolved and then eventually, you know, there has been a great desire that the Supreme Court, that we have a separate Supreme Court as a, a, court, of, as a court of appeal. I think um, there's been efforts for mediation to be much more formal. 
certain parts of the beginning very strong, particularly in East New Britain, have always been very strong in their mediation capacity. And mediators that you will meet in the country, people who are doing this kind of work. That had a big influence on my work uh, when I went to set, asked to set up the uh, Compliance Advisor Ombudsman at the private sector side of the World Banker. And, and I think the work that I did there had a big influence on my work at the forum mm -hmm. in terms of the voice of people. Mm -hmm. Because what it did was anybody could file a case to that office. It's a nightmare for them still, but in my view is, you know, live with it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I said I wanted to encourage a yeah. Talanoa or talk story, so I'd love to open up the floor now for questions. Um, it's not often that we all get to speak with such um, eminent regional leaders and um, lawyers and jurists. So are there any questions? I know there are. The question is who's going to ask the first one? <laughs> Thank you so much. Very informed. I really appreciate the opportunity. I uh, am currently working at the German Embassy as an advisor to the Special Envoy for the Pacific Island States. And I think the fact that there is a Special Envoy for the Pacific Island States suggests that countries like Germany are starting to realise that um, the Pacific is geostrategically important and um, they need to think more seriously about how they engage with Pacific Island states. But I don't, I don't know, I think I, I would be interested in your views as to what sorts of mechanisms would work best. I mean, um, you were talking about regional organisations like Pacific Island Forum, um, where there's a dialogue partners um, arrangement for some exchange. Um, or whether bilateral arrangements um, are preferable, or whether it depends on individual state situations. Um, I'd just be interested to hear your views. Germany? Yes. All right. Both, both our countries were colonised by Germany. Yes. <laughs> no, most Germans have no idea no. about that. And then you put a passport and they go, where is this from? And I go, what, the history? <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a very, yeah. very slow process for things yeah. in Germany to realise that it had a colonial past. But um, it, 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 uh, I must say that your country has been a, a most helpful country in some of the work that I have been involved with. Um, I don't know whether Dr. Ian Fry uh, agrees with this, but I've always found the German um, delegation uh, to be generally uh, understanding and, and sometimes outwardly supportive of our work on climate change. Um, whether alone or as part of the European, I think your arrangement in Europe means that it's the Commission that drives the brief on climate change, and that's understandable. But I think as a country, you have been kind enough to, to be of, of good understanding of the needs and the, the concerns and the claims of the small island developing states. Mm -hmm. I speak of one particular um, instance. Uh, since 2007, I believe, um, when Germany was serving on the Security Council, um, it helped to facilitate the first ever debate at the Security Council level of climate change as a possible, and I say possible, um, element in the international peace and security. International peace and security being, of course, the core responsibility of the Security Council. Now, Germany happened to be the president of the Security Council at the time, and as I say, to facilitate um, it, uh, this was an opportunity which the island countries, the AOSIS grouping, had sought for many, many years um, to invite the world community um, uh, first um, 
uh, to understand and even appreciate uh, the dangers uh, that were being faced and suffered by small island countries and vulnerable communities and two for the Security Council to, plea, uh, to, to treat climate change seriously enough to consider declaring it as an issue of international peace and security. Um, and, and, and so that uh, from that year, uh, the island countries, a Yosis uh, group, were able to appear before the Security Council and to present um, their, their viewpoints. There have been subsequent occasions when other very helpful countries. But we met with an argument that has been repeated and repeated again. Thank you, we hear, we're sorry about your dilemma and your danger, but take it to the Convention on Climate Change, which is the appropriate medium uh, for discussing and resolving issues on climate change. That's a total cop-out, total cop-out. Because the United Nations Convention on Climate Change is one, it's only a framework. Two, it's in aspirational language. The ultimate objective is we, we the world community, should fix this global danger, ultimate, for God's sake. It's now. It's not language that's implementable by practical action. It's aspirational language, and that's the problem. And it's not only, I must say, it's not only a few countries that will drive us out of the Security Council where it's with this issue rightfully belongs in my respectful opinion, and whether it's respected or not, it's certainly my opinion. It belongs there, but we get driven to the uh, convention process. Now, the convention process, like climate uh, change convention, that's not the only one. That is where the argument uh, and, and the process, it's a highly political process driven by major and the powerful nations. There's no way we're going to get an emphatic, useful and effective response under the, uh, the, the Convention on Climate Change unless something else happens. Sorry about that answer, it's a bit long, but... Um, so my question is sort of uh, just off this discussion that we just had here. Um, how much do you think, you know, with how the Pacific is becoming geopolitically important and um, uh, the supposed threat of China, has that sort of leveraged, or has the Pacific leveraged that to get more action or more you know, commitment on climate change from you know, countries like Germany and the rest of the world. Um, has that been something that um, you've, like, in your time at the forum, you've been able to see that because we're becoming more important um, to you know, the security concern, do you think there will be one day when this becomes a peace and security issue for the security council? climate issue and the safety of people became a key issue for the Pacific at the um, Forum Island meeting in Nauru and the Boy Declaration. And I think it's the first time that the, the Pacific seriously addressed this, that it's not, security is not just a geopolitical issue, it's about people and how, how we live. But how it's been leveraged um, I think this is a big question mark, and others. I'm, I'm happy for others to contribute on this that are watching this, like, like Ian, and of course, um, and also Tom, who's been very vocal on all these issues. I think that um, what's happening now is, if you see where the resources are going with the AUKUS, it's about uh, militarization in the region, uh, and I think the countries in the Pacific are concerned that. 
the one priority for the Pacific is what is happening in climate impact is now not at the forefront. And, and for every community, whether you live in right on the edge of the sea or in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, climate impact is real. And what's happening to your agricultural products, farming, all of these things, all of, it's all being felt. And we've got to educate our people in larger countries that don't see the, the correlation of what is happening in terms of sea level rise and what's happening to your environment. But people certainly know that there is impact because they talk about it because it's, uh, it's on public uh, on media and there are discussions around it. I think that, um, you know, my concern is that this is just not going to be get the attention that we require. But I am pleased that what has happened now with the issue at the General Assembly and the efforts of Vanuatu, driven by, initiated by the young people in the Pacific, the law students in Vanuatu, and then with climate warriors, that we now have something that will go to the International Court of Justice for a determination on this, well, not a determination, sorry, for an advisory opinion, which is not legally binding, but it's the momentum of other um, other cases as well uh, that Tuvalu has uh, in terms of declaration of nationhood, etc. I think these issues are really important for us. Um, Neroni, you want to add on that? I think we, we, we welcome any initiative um, by Germany and, and others. Uh, Germany and others are, um, are partnership countries and observers uh, to our forum leaders uh, consider, uh, meetings. Uh, so, of course, but we cannot rely uh, on, on just these uh, initiatives. Um, um, we need to carry on um, uh, with what we're doing, and we have been doing it since the 1990s. Uh, the, our people, our communities have found themselves as the, in a role as the warning system of this world on a major global issue. That is our position, and we cannot give up now but to play this role as the essential warning system for the, 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 the region. It does not mean that we, it is for us to assume the full responsibilities. As you know, we've tried very hard to seek fairness of treatment from the world community uh, our pleas of sh severe and disproportionate um, effects on our communities, but it falls on, on deaf ears. We're finding it difficult to work out on, 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 uh, on, the, on, on the cost, just to bear the cost uh, of the loss of revenues from economies that are devastated. Loss and damage has become a difficult issue. So we need to carry on this uh, advocacy that is so essential. Initially, it was left to people like Dr. Ian Fry, a mere official, to cry out and to ask uh, for fair treatment. I'm extremely happy that in time, our Pacific leaders in particular in the person of President Tong, had taken it up. Our leaders now are the main advocates, advocates of justice from the world community on this problem. We cannot deal with it because it, of its globality. We cannot deal with climate change because of its totality. These are the dangers, but it's not danger for just you and me, it's danger for everybody. And it needs to continue because it's for real. And if you understand a little bit of the science, and the science is overwhelming, it's frightening, what is happening in climate change is interconnected with other social and environmental systems of the world, including our own. 
in so many complicated and difficult and fundamental ways. So yes, we welcome the envoy system of, the, uh, of Germany and others. But it also means that we need to do our bit. We don't sit around and pray for help. We need to find help. How many Pacific countries over the years have assigned a dedicated ministry on climate change? or ambassador or minister. How many? Australia can do it, New Zealand can afford it, but how many of us? Are we just sitting there waiting for everybody else to do it? This is a time of opportunity. A time for us to do serious work on helping ourselves. Renewable energy is an obvious field of opportunity. I know there are problems, but do what we can. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to lecture you, I know, you, you know all this. Yes, I know there was a question yeah. at the back somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and just raise your voice because we can't necessarily hear at the front. I think my voice will carry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi everyone, I'm Philippe and I do, I'm an international human rights lawyer and I work in, uh, in the Pacific and in Asia and I work in feminist climate justice. Um, I was at PIVS for a short minute while you were leading. Um, for a minute? Uh, yeah, for a minute. For a what? minute. Um, and I respect how you navigated those spaces, and it's great to see you here. Um, and being very honest about, you know, it wasn't an easy time for PG at the time. My question is, and as lawyers, there's a couple of us here from the Pacific, we understand the very heavy limitations of legal advocacy, particularly if we're going after foreign corporations from the islands and holding them accountable. So I would like to understand from your perspective and your views, aside from legal advocacy, what can the movement and the people in the region do in terms of being more aware, informed, but also being part of meaningful participatory processes? And I'm not sure what avenues there are, I haven't been in the region for a long time. Because, and I'm trying to play the devil's advocate, like I see the process going through ICJ, but it will take time. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. To get cases into Pacific Court takes time. Mm -hmm. To enforce those orders may or may not happen. So what other avenues for accountability and redress we can have in the region, given the constraints of the system that we work with? Well, I think you answered it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope not. I mean, it does take time. But I think we've got to have a. Yeah. Yes, sir. I think we've got to keep keep the momentum of the advocacy plus the submissions to to the International Court of Justice on these issues. I think we've got to be much more conscious of building relationships with uh, countries in on the African continent that are also suffering. I think they there's often. Um, there, was, there is commentary that the Pacific and island communities were always the ones that keep going on about uh, how how done we are when you've got other uh, when you've got countries in on the continent of Africa that are really uh, look, look what's happening in Somalia at the moment and they just and I think we've got to build those bridges so that we have um, bridges across the world in terms of communities that are also feeling it and they're, and they're, they're also at the forefront of this, it's just that it, it's different to the way we see it in the Pacific but even in the Pacific I think there is also a tendency that some, some countries, well not a tendency but there is reality that some countries are right up there, you know, their time is, is much more limited than those of us who have got a greater land mass and what are we doing to help each other <clears throat> and particularly with the, putting forward their putting forward a very solid case constantly. I don't think the Pacific in the... Li the Pacific leaders make a statement at the forum, but I think we're not great advocates as we were. I think that right now, a lot... For many of us who are talking about 
the geopolitics of the region, we're captured by other threats that are emerging, and we're and we're we're losing traction. Well, even in my in my own language, when I sometimes talk about geopolitics, I'm reminded by friends. When I, I think it was Kalio that was saying it to me the other day. <coughs> if we're here, because if the climate is, if the if we don't address the climate issues, we're not going to be here as a people. Doesn't matter, and the generations to come will also be finding it hard to be here. I, I think that there's great power in writing and in advocacy, but getting the leaders of the Pacific to be really vocal on this, but not just at the Pacific Island Forum meeting, constantly. And the foreign ministers should be doing this. Now, there was some discussion with some people yesterday that uh, Australia, you know, has put in for a bid to host the COP. 29, and what did I think about that? And what did we all think about that? Well, many Pacific countries think that they can use it to their advantage if you have it here. I'm not so sure about that. I am not so sure about that. Because I've virtually given up on COP. I just think it's more talk, talk, talk. Right now, I think we've got to find all sorts of avenues where we can test the limits uh, and uh, through the international courts I think it's very important. I'm going to take the questions all starting. So I'm going to propose this. I'm aware that some people will need to leave because we're running after time, but it feels like the Talanoa is only just starting. So I'll take the questions, but perhaps we can collectively thank our speakers now so that those that do need to, to leave at some point can do so. I wanted to formally thank you both, but I also think it's an important conversation that is happening, so please feel free to stay. And also, there's a ton of sandwiches up there. So, Fleur, I'm going to go to you at the back now. And just remember to stand up and perhaps introduce um, yourself as well, because not everyone in the room knows each other. Uh, love. Uh, my name is Fleur Ramsey. I'm a um, Samoan uh, environmental and human rights lawyer with the Pacifica program at the Environmental Defence Office. Um, uh, Tuli Loma, can I ask you a question and also um, Dane B. You were involved in drafting um, the definition of ecocide. Um, there's been some recent um, reports by the Special Rapporteur um, on contemporary forms of uh, racism that talks about how um, the Pacific is being uh, potentially sacrificed um, by the more wealthy powers because they're not wanting to stop at uh, 1.5. There's been a number of Australian um, gas companies that have been um, arguing that we should forget about 1.5. Um, so I'm just interested in your view on, on what potential there is uh, for Ecoside as a, um, a narrative, um, but also as a tool, a legal tool. Um, and I'm also interested um, in Dame Meg Taylor, your view on whether uh, Pacific, Pacifica lawyers like ourselves should be looking um, to advancing cases in our own courts. So there's a lot of potential to advance cases in other courts in the Pacific, but with a, we should be going to our own courts and giving them an opportunity um, to develop a discourse on climate change. Thank you. On the um, on going to courts, um, um, UNEP has, um, in the past uh, few years, had uh, brought out a fairly major study uh, on all the initiatives taken around the world on legal actions uh, taken uh, to. You, it, where, where the climate issue has been taken to court, either for prosecutorial purposes or more for regulatory purposes. And it's very interesting, and if you do not know that study already, I'd invite you to have a look. It's, it's very instructive, and it's a study that is being kept up um, up to date um, uh, across and it draws from the experience not only of countries but from the uh, legal the law uh, associations from around the world I think it's a very useful practical uh, uh, document to work from 
On eco side, um, as you know, um, the, the, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court at the moment provides for, uh, it, it's a court that was set up to deal with the grave and, seri uh, and, and serious uh, and crimes of serious concern to the international co uh, community. At the moment, there are four such crimes which the the, the world community has agreed on of a sufficient uh, seriousness. Um, uh, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. So there are only four. Um, ecocide, which is the widespread killing, generally means the widespread killing of the environment. Um, is presently covered um, under the Rome Statute, but only as a crime in wartime, uh, where there, the, the, in a military campaign or action, for example, it becomes excessive or unnecessarily excessive proportionate to the uh, military objective. So, um, there is no, currently no crime in international law against damaging the environment as such. So that is the problem which, uh, for which we had been tasked to produce this definition. Now, of course, it is yet to be, to meet the, uh, the scrutiny of member governments. So we have to go through that process because if the genocide definition becomes, ac becomes acceptable uh, to member governments according to the procedures of the um, Rome Statute, then it goes in. But at that stage, it will be open to improvement. And I'm sure there could be improvement. It's not been done before, and it's very difficult for any of us on the panel to claim any perfection of any sort, and, and it, it certainly does not. Um, but it is, the definition is a response to what we already know of a very serious, very gross um, degradation of the environmental, of the, the, the global environmental generally uh, in the oceans, in the, in, 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 the, in the territory, in the land area, and in the atmosphere, including climate change. So, so that was part of the purpose, I suppose you could call it political, certainly part, of, because this is an issue being pursued by civil society, uh, and rightly so. Uh, and uh, but whether it you know it uh, warms the hearts of the the states membership of the world we don't know, so it still remains uh, to be looked at. Uh, I'm sure looked at with very great care. Thank you. There was a question up the front here, and then Joey, I'll go back to you. Okay, uh, there was one here first. Yes. Yes. Um, my name is David Pokerty. I'm the climate change correspondent for Straits Times in Singapore. Um, it seems as though I'm a long way away. I'm actually from Canberra originally. My question is really around um, uh, climate change and human rights, which um, I know that the Pacific community, Caribbean islands and so forth, have long wanted closer um, understanding of the human rights implications of climate change. Um, and you quite rightly mentioned how the UNFCCC process has not delivered in bringing the much needed sort of recognition of the climate impacts uh, on the, the lives and cultures of Pacific Islanders and, and beyond. So do you think the process that has been launched, was about to be launched through the ICJ, um, is an important new avenue that could drive greater climate action in terms of emissions reductions? by the big pollutants. Do you think this is perhaps the threat of eventual litigation by against governments or against corporations? Could be the next phase that could drive greater action? It could be, it's probably a little bit late, I suppose, but for some for some nations, but at least drive um, the chance of, of reducing the impacts for the most vulnerable nations, particularly in the Pacific. The purpose of the uh, ICJ submission, um 
is to get to look at what state responsibilities are. And it's an advisory opinion, it's not legally binding. Sure, but I'm thinking about afterwards, right? Yeah, when it comes it, it's, well, it could. It could. But um, this is going to take time, and I think the quality of the submissions to the ICJ from the Pacific countries, plus I hope from the continent of Africa, will need to be very forceful with very good arguments that could help to set up then a situation where litigation um, may happen. But I don't, I, I can't, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that that's, that was just the sole purpose of this. Sure. Look, climate change and climate change impacts start with people and ends with people. It has to be about human rights. When you're denied the right to life, the right to food and shelter, these are all the impacts of climate change. The, the advisory opinions, there are actually three courts that have been asked, not only the, the ICJ, but the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, as well as the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. There you are. Uh, are they binding? Very clearly, that's a very clear provision under the American, uh, the inter-American uh, 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 convention. It does not. Um, it's, it's now with the ICJ. I think myself whether it's legally binding by the strict definition of lawyers, and I'm not convinced of the arguments. It is certainly from the ICJ, which is the principal legal organ of the United Nations. You cannot get it any lower than that. The principal legal organ of the United Nations under the Charter of the UN. Uh, if it comes up with an advisory opinion requested by the United Nations General Assembly, in my view, it is binding on the United Nations. Why else, I would argue, would it not? So therefore, if you accept that type of reasoning, then it has more than an authoritative statement of international law and state responsibility. It must have some, at least a guiding authority and importance to the work of the United Nations and of the General Assembly itself and of the United Nations agencies. That is my, my, uh, that would be my own argument. Uh, but I think more seriously, it is, if it works out, and it depends very much on it works out, first of all there is a problem of possible conflict of, of, of opinions amongst three different tribunals. And we've got so many judges, 15 from the ICJ, seven from the tribunal, and I think 21 from ITLOS. That's right, yes, we've got an expert behind you. Huge number of people from different legal backgrounds and they have their own, the courts themselves have their own legal order. Um, so there's going to be a massive responsibility on the judges to ensure that there is no unnecessary and difficult conflict. At the same time, I, I haven't read it for this morning, but I, seem, I think the ICJ uh, request is significant in that it recites a number of conventions, including the UNFCCC. It also recites the Universal Declaration of Rights. So I do feel that it provides the ICJ with perhaps that scope and the latitude to cover the sorts of issues that I think it would be covered in your question. But I say the main thing is clarity coherence in the framing of international law, so critically important. But I would make a, a further point. It is not so much what the judges 
do or think. It is what the question says. And that's always been a risk. If you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers. I know it because I was involved in the illegality of nuclear weapons uh, reference back in 1995-96. And the court, to some of us, gave an answer which has become a bit problematical because our position on that issue was nuclear weapons are not lawful under any circumstances. But the court saw the question differently and answered, it may, under different circumstances, be lawful. And you look how that has been used. Look at what Putin is doing. So be careful on what you seek. Again, I apologize for going on. No, not at all. But, thank you. Joey, I've noticed your hand going up. Hi, I'm Mr. Chaitra, distinguished panelist. Um, Joey Carr from the Pacific African Organization. I'm not a lawyer, but have been working with civil society uh, within the region. I'm uh, very much interested in the panel's perspective on our clause. Uh, Naroni made reference to uh, your early participation in the negotiations of, of UNCLOS. Um, and there was a time when post-independence, most of us in the United States were um, being engaged. But we fast forward today in the context of climate change. Some of our Pacific Island states are sponsoring states of deep sea mining. Uh, we're in a context where there's negotiations for our international regulation to commence its mining. Now let's treat the process. Very much interested in your, you know, the panel's perspective on UNCLOS in the current context of climate change, where we are today, and in the current context of a declining ocean, how the health of our oceans. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think so we, we, we probably have, uh... <coughs> all right, well, that's a big question. We need a whole, uh, yeah. Look, um, UNCLOS, um, I think it's, um, I think we've mentioned already that that was raised by leaders way back from the start. So, and, and I do personally believe that our region has um, behaved with conscientiousness it's engaged in all of the, um, of the major negotiations on, 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 on UNCLOS at different stages. UNCLOS uh, completed in 1982. It's a framework convention, so it does not deal with everything. So we have to fill in bits, uh, one of which, for example, the uh, UN stocks, uh, fish stocks agreement in 1995 deals with the highly migratory fish stocks, the tuna of which we have great abundance in our region and which brings in so much money for our communities. We had an exceptional Pacific presence there and so many of our countries had actually contributed in hugely important ways um, in the defining uh, uh, of the precautionary principle and the application of the, uh, of the precautionary principle to take account of the special interest of developing countries, in particular uh, countries like our own, the developing countries, and in the conservation and the management, sensible, sustainable management of this particular fishery. So we've taken um, I think, I don't know whether I've mentioned um, under um, Dame Meg's uh, time, uh, the Pacific region uh, under the leadership of the Forum Secretary is now playing an active role um, in the uh, work before the International Law Commission on uh, sea level rise. Um, and uh, the leaders in 2021 had uh, may, uh, made a declaration on, on the boundaries, uh, on, the, on the sustainable integrity um, and the force 
of uh, maritime boundaries that have been set up but, uh, and registered under UNCLOS provisions. So I think, allow me to, to say that the, these might serve uh, uh, hopefully as an answer to your question, but there are other rather difficult issues of UNCLOS that are also important. Thank you. That's going on at the pits right now, particularly on the boundaries, is really important. Yes. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, we mm. secure all that. Having said that, my, my, and I think it's really important that we get our legal institutions, our law schools, and students who are working on this to be very familiar with what is going on so that you can draw on them for expertise and the knowledge that you need to be able to put these uh, cases forward. My concern is, though, that you know we worry about these issues, but the big powers, we're, we're, we're caught in the crossfire. Um, you know, 40% of the Pacific Ocean comes under the jurisdiction of the Pacific Island states, but you wouldn't know it. Everything that's going on is being decided by big powers, and the strategic interests are now becoming... Uh, the conversation of the day and we're losing track of what is so important for us is the survival of the Pacific as a people. I've been pretty depressed in the last couple of days looking at articles that are coming out written by our own Pacific scholars and that um, what is happening is taking us further and further away from the unity that we've had. Huh? And I was reading last night Sir Michael Samari's First, uh, into, well, his intervention in 1974 in Tahiti when Papua New Guinea became a member of PIPS when he said, we're not here to rock the boat, uh, we're here to add a sail to the canoe so that we will fulfil our, our, our expectations. Mm -hmm. And ha have we fulfilled them? Uh, we've, we've come a long way. <coughs> but the challenges of climate and the impact on our peoples, our livelihoods, and the definition of nationhood itself, that uh, because we lose our land, we will not have our countries. Uh, this is going to be a big issue for us. I think civil society has to work very strongly in pushing hard for, for leaders in all our countries to be speaking out on this. But in the meantime, um, the AUKUS uh, debate is of serious concern in the region when we, and, when, and we don't want to lose traction on what is happening in terms of climate. That seems like a, a segue into what Nick might ask about. Hello, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick McClellan from Islands Business Magazine. I actually wanted to ask a legal question. Okay. <laughs> um, my least favourite piece of jargon at the moment is rules-based order. Um, it's everywhere in communiques and so on. And I'm wondering whether you could reflect on that as to whether the rules based order is undercutting international <coughs> law. Um, I'm old only... fashioned where, you know, he who has the gold makes the rules. Um, then rules based orders are being contested by the United States, by China, by other major powers. And Pacific countries, as we've talked about, are using UN agencies, the General Assembly and so on, to advance the Blue Pacific Agenda. Is the rules-based order undercutting the vast bulk of humanity that aren't major powers? Well, I, I think rules-based order means international law. It has to. Um, the, the, the problem is um, it's... it's um, when it's, um, it becomes uncomfortable law for many countries, and some withdraw uh, from, the particular, or from particular rules of international law. Um, there have been countries who walked out of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I know I, I, I cannot be 100% sure because I, I, um, I, I've not checked it, but I think if they've done so because of the procedures that are permissible under the Paris Agreement that any country may withdraw. So it's entirely, uh, a, you know, a, a procedural matter. 
But it's, uh, other countries have withdrawn from, um, from inst uh, organizations within the UN. UNESCO is as obvious, it, it happens. It, it, um, other countries allow international law to be made, but they do not become part of it. They sign it, but they do not ratify it. So it's not part of their domestic responsibility. Kyoto Protocol uh, is one, the Rome Statute of the ICC. But let me also remind you that in, in my experience, none of these international agreements are ever done in my, the time I've been involved without the participation of the major countries. Uh, Kyoto Protocol would not have existed without the United States signing in. I know because we were working with Al Gore on it in Kyoto. I know because he informed us that while he does so, he had to check with Clinton, and they knew that there was no way that the Senate would allow ratification of that. So that's the problem. But they never ratified. That they never ratified. <laughs> that to this day, the United States has not ratified the law of the sea, I don't believe. Nothing. To this day, the United States has not uh, ratified the protocols of the, um, uh, of the Treaty of Rarotonga. Is that correct? I, I think that that's probably correct. And all the uh, thank you, Nick. All the yeah. Pacific countries haven't well, yes, um, except that um, it, it, that's an interesting one. Um, Marshall Islands, which is not a party to the, um, to the um, Treaty of Rarotonga, had taken uh, all countries uh, with nuclear weapons to the International C uh, Court of Justice in what 2012, I think. Not a lot, not a, you know. So, so there you are. Um, but my, that's my take on this one, Nick. Um, I think it is international law, and I think we can call it as such because the majority of members of the international community. Uh, have negotiated for such a law in terms that are um, uh, that have been signed up to, but uh, the, the 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 ratification process uh, makes it uh, not uh, international, perhaps not formal international law for those jurisdictions. Um, but I I think the the uh, Madam Moderator the real emphasis. Uh, of the question is, is why do we need it for our region? Um, and my answer is without question, that is the only antidote that communities like our own, small, powerless, in, in the face of many of these global issues, we can only rely to a standard of behavior and conduct that accords uh, with the principles that are often embedded in these instrument, uh, 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 instruments of international uh, law and blessed by, the, you know, by the, the, the signature and ratification, if not all countries of the international community, at least by the majority of such countries. So thank you very much. Actually, feels like we have come full circle because we started our conversation today with a discussion. I asked you why law, and you both said, "Well, <laughs> agricultural science or ag, ag economics um, or science." And Noroni, I think you've just given us an answer as to why we might continue to pursue law as an avenue for justice. Um, so, thank you both very much for your time. I know that there's more questions. Um, I'm going to formally wrap up now but by thanking you so much for the gift of your time and your knowledge to the ANU College floor, to the ANU and to the audience here. And I would welcome everyone now to continue the conversation. Please help yourselves to the sandwiches. But thank you so much for sharing with us today.